thank you for watching over us and providing for us and every good thing. We realize that all of our blessings come from your hand. Father, we ask your blessings on our country. In so many ways, we continue to need your care. We pray that you will be with us as we go through a very important period of electing government officials to watch over the affairs of our country. We pray that your hand will be on these events as they unfold. Father, we're mindful of those of our congregation who have ongoing needs. We pray your blessings on each of them. We pray that those who are home and away will soon be able to be back with us and that we will be returned together. We pray that those who are suffering difficulties will, will be recovered from their condition. We pray that you will provide for them. Father, we ask your blessings on, on Holton George, that you'll provide for him and those who provide for his care. We pray that his life will be uh, recovered and he'll soon be back home with his family where he would like to be. Father, watch over this congregation, be with our elders, be with our deacons as the, they execute various works and functions, be with all of our members and every one of us as we serve you. Father, help us to be faithful in that service. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, verse 2 is where I've got Mark to start. I need to, here's the bad word, back up a little bit, uh, because it's difficult to start without a context, and we uh, are contextually uh, entering some uh, important information. Verses 1 and 2 are uh, stand apart. Uh, verses. They, uh, they are very important for the church. They describe an approved uh, process uh, for the church, by the church, to handle our needs. So that those things that may come up and, and uh, uh, have a need for us to deal with, uh, it is a model for that. When we go to Acts chapter 6, and uh, we see the unfolding problems at the early church of the Grecian widows not being provided for, or at least the claim that they weren't being provided for in equity, um, the same as the Hebrew widows. The church uh, directed several men to serve uh, to take care of that need. That service, that appointment for service, is where we get our concept for deacons, men appointed to serve. But that, sir, that is the model for deacon functioning. It's not, that's not an instruction on how to appoint deacons, what to tell deacons what to do, etc. It is the model of the church had a physical need to be provided for, and they appointed special men to do it. And those qualifications then are spelled out in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, when Paul writes his letter to the Philippians, he writes it to the elders and deacons of the church. That's right. So uh, the church fully formed has both elders and oversight and deacons who have responsibility to make sure that certain things are taken care of. In the same way, Acts chapter 16 provides for us a model for how to handle the financial needs of the church, uh, the needs of other churches, the needs of individual Christians, etc., things that might come up. All right. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders, it would appear to me, as we come to Acts chapter 6, oh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 16, 1, that Paul had talked about this before, that this is not the first time he's discussed this topic. Concerning uh, the contribution or the collection. Maybe I'm wrong. It may be that this is a brand new topic, but the fact that he says, I have given orders through all the churches of Macedonia, uh, or Galatia rather, um, so now I'm giving these things to you. This was a broad thing. It wasn't for the Corinthians only. So that sets it up as a, uh, a model for us to recognize. Uh, the topic or issue is taking up money for those who have need. And in this particular case, they were going to be sending this money to Jerusalem uh, to distribute there. 
Um, the word Galatia, when we have our, our book Galatians, it's not, a, uh, it's not a city, it's a region. If you're talking about the state of Alabama, it's not a city, it's a region. Galatia is a region, same way. It's like a state. Maybe not quite so clearly formed, but that's how you make the comparison. Um, and it was something that they, they needed to do. Um, I've given orders to those churches and verse 16, the last, uh, verse 1, the last part, so you must do also. There was, a, this was an obligation. There was a responsibility for those who were a part of the church individually. They had a choice of how much they were going to give, but they had a responsibility to give. What do we call people who, uh, it may not be a particular name, who are part of a group but don't do anything to help the group? Dead weight, deadbeat. Freeloaders is another word that comes to mind. How many of you are familiar with the uh, the little, um, is it Aesop's fable? The little red hen? Or at least the, the little story of the little red hen. Steve, you look concerned. Do I need to tell you the story of the little red hen? Sure. Okay, well, you probably know it well. <clears throat> the little red hen who found the grain and uh, what do you do with grain? Well, in order to make bread, you've got to grind the grain, so you've got to take the grain to get it ground, and uh, the duck wouldn't help, and the cat wouldn't help, and the pig wouldn't help, and so the little red hen took the grain and got it ground. And after it was ground, then you had to make it into bread, and the duck wouldn't help, and the pig wouldn't help, and the, and, uh, the cat wouldn't help, so the little red hen had to make the bread. And then she got around to, well, who will eat the bread? Oh, I will, said the duck. Oh, I will, said the pig. Oh, I will, said the cat. And the little red hen said, oh, no, you won't. And she and her little chicks ate all the bread. Well, is that fair? Yes. Justin says it's fair. Bubba says it's fair. I say it's fair, too. What? I, think I say it's fair. We're in a society now where there's a lot of people expect a lot of stuff. We're living in a culture now, it's a lot of subculture too. They expect to do nothing and get paid for it. And get Gee, uh, Paul dealt with that topic specifically in 2 Thessalonians, and that is too far into the weeds for us to go. Uh, so we're, we're going to, I'm going to pause from going there because I'll never get back if we go there. But Paul said to the Thess the second, in the 2 Thessalonian letter to the church at Thessalonica, if they won't work, they won't eat. don't feed them. And he's talking to members of the church. If they will not work, you don't feed them. Now that's hard to do. That's tough love right there. But that's Paul's instruction, that we have a responsibility to take care of the group that we're a part of. So, um, all right. They can't do for themselves that we take care of. There's a difference in can't do and won't do. That's right, but other people take advantage of that. Indeed. Yes. All right, verse 2. On the first day of the week, when are we going to do whatever it is we're talking about? It's going to be on the first day of the week that uh, it's going to take place. Why the first day of the week? That's when it all began. Very convenient. First day. Why? It's convenient. It's convenient to meet on the first day? Well, they're giving because they're all together. Okay. The convenience. You don't have to go around and gather. Everybody's there. That's being separate. together. Uh, okay. But why did they meet on the first day of the week? Where's it commanded? So it's. Perhaps what you're looking for is Acts 27, which is not a commandment, but it is a recognized passage. That on the first day of the week, Paul and the city of Troas gathered with the church, and they gathered together to break bread. Acts 27 is that model. So the church met 
to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, Acts 27, with the Apostle Paul there, and that's when they did it. All right. Now, other reasons why first day of the week might be significant? There's some places in town, not all of them will be labeled in this way, but some of them will have signs that say Seventh-day Adventist. What the Seventh-day Adventist teach? Church on Saturday. But you go to church on Saturday. Why? Saturday. It's really sunset Friday night, but you can't go out. Why? Because they are following the Old Testament Jewish concepts. That's exactly right. The Old Testament law told Israel to honor the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is the seventh day or last day of the week. And uh, But the early church did not meet on the Sabbath day. They met on the first day of the week. And when Paul tells them to have their collection, he tells them to have it on the first day of the week. What do you know when Paul tells them on the first day of the week to have their collection? Sunday. That's when they were meeting for church. That's right. There, why was that the case? Well, go back to Matthew chapter 28 verse 1. We can't go that far in the weeds. Let me get back here. Matthew 28 1. When are we talking about? Now after the Sabbath as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, it was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord had come and rolled away the stone, and the Lord had risen from the dead. On what day did the Lord rise? First day. All right, so the resurrection of Jesus took place on the first day of the week. Okay, well... So what? All right, well, let's add one little, one more point there. And uh, when um, John is in, let's go read it, John 1.10. I'm sorry, Revelation 1, verse 10. We'll start in verse 9 to get the context of what we're talking about. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. He was where, when? He's on the island of Patmos. He's talking about a particular time. What time is he talking about? What, what is the Lord's day? It is going to become the standard discussion. This is the first time we have it in Scripture. The only time, I think. Uh, but this is going to become very well known as Sunday is the Lord's Day to all Christians. That is going to become a normal thing. Did you, growing up, those of you who grew up going to church, did you ever hear your parents talk about the Lord's Day? Yeah. I heard that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Yeah. So what's the significance of the Lord's Day? What day was the Lord's Day? Was there any question about when the Lord's Day was? Now, one like Thanksgiving or uh, Fourth of July, it was an every week thing. What day? First day. Okay, so we're going to have the Lord's, Lord's Day. If we were looking at the New Testament and we had no idea what this was, do you think we might be able to find it by looking at some of these scriptures? That uh, Paul says to gather together and make your contribution when? First day of the week. Acts 20 verse 7, the church came together to take the Lord's Supper. What day? First day of the week. Lord was raised from the dead. What day? First day of the week. The disciples were gathered together when Jesus appeared to them on what day? First day of the week. Wow, you see the pattern here? I hope so. Paul trying to organize the church. Yep. 
He was. Set one standard for everybody that, to live by. Everybody's doing the same thing. That's right. Setting policy, if you will. He said, I've commanded this to all the other churches. I'm commanding it to you as well. This is an obligation. All right. So on the first day of the week, which first day of the week? Every. Every first day of the week. Every week has a first day, and every first day is the Lord's Day. Okay? So that makes that a fairly significant. All right. Who has this responsibility? On the first day of the week, who? What are you reading? Verse 2. On the first day of the week, what? Let each one of you, or every one of you, who has an obligation. All right, we got it on the first day. I'll just scoot over here. That's the wind. Who? Oops. Who? Every one of you. Everyone. Each of us has a responsibility to give. Each of them had a responsibility to give. Let's make it uh, politically, I mean, uh, uh, correct in kind. Uh, Chip's not with us this morning. He kept us, he offered a perspective last week. Some folks have argued that uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 do not apply to us today. It wasn't written to us. No, it wasn't written to us. It wasn't written to us. You look confused, Robin. Go ahead, Corinthians. It was written to the Corinthians. That's right. We didn't live in that time. We weren't there. It wasn't written to us. Does it apply to us in principle? Yes. The principle applies. Was it directly written to us? No. Does the principle apply? Yes. Would we use that in any other place? Well, I don't know. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I've also delivered to you on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, all of you. After the supper, he took the cup likewise, blessed it, gave it to the disciples, said, all of you drink of it. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Now, did we get a letter telling us to take the Lord's Supper? Nope. I've never gotten a letter written to me by the Apostle Paul. Have you? No, you haven't. Well, so then I don't have to partake of the Lord's Supper? No, I do have to. This principle was given to the church to be passed down to all persons. So while we did not receive a letter concerning the contribution, and while we may not be taking up a contribution for the church or the saints in Jerusalem, we still have a uh, universal obligation to provide for the well-being of the church. Uh, and I'll identify this a little more in a second. Okay, so which one of us? Every one of us, what are we going to do? We're going to lay something aside, <laughs> storing up. All right. Who? Let's get in here. What? What are we going to do? We're going to lay aside, storing up. All right, what does that mean? To lay aside, storing up. It means to start planning for it. We're planning. Right. So you're, you're, you've got a purpose in mind, and you're making sure you're prepared for that purpose. Otherwise, it could, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it when it comes. I'm tempted at some point to let Steve tell you about the camping story of him and his family. Oh, Those of you who guys have heard it, I know. He told it to us but, I know. I just happen to know that he's gone camping. I don't know about the rest of you. Well, I know about me. How many of you are campers, present or past? Okay, about half. When do you start getting ready for a camping trip? When you get in the car and turn the key, start driving toward the campground? No, that is not when you begin. When do you begin? At least a week before. Hours, days, perhaps weeks before you start preparing all of the pieces that will be necessary for you to execute on that one time. In Why? In case I pray fervently. 
<laughs> there you go. The man who also had a wheel come off of the trailer driving home from the camping trip. Now, if that's not Providence, I don't know what is. If it happened on the way to the camping trip, there'd been no camping trip. But it happened on the way home, so... You don't go tandem with Steve at the bottom story. Just yeah, he's, he's definitely does. bad luck. Tom and Sandra also. Uh, I think they had several absolute disasters while camping. Uh, nonetheless, uh, digging ourselves away from that, there are things that you need to do for which you have to begin preparations long in advance. You get ready before the execution of the event. Why? Because you can't do it on the day. Paul had an event that needed to be done and there wasn't possible to do it on the day. And so this needed to be done in advance so you get ready and, uh, and, and you, you're, going to, you're going to do this. All right, so um, we'll get to a couple of other things about it's a universal expectation everybody's going to do it what are we going to do we're going to lay aside we're storing up something so there's going to be a gradual collection uh, of, uh, of funds so that it can be distributed at the proper time and good morning good to see you I didn't expect to see you during this time period as if she needed something else Libby had a, uh, a treatment of stuff on Friday that uh, for osteoporosis which they said will probably lay you out for a few days uh, so okay. she uh, I just Wife, or the woman you gave me, she's the one who. <clears throat> anyway, a gathering, okay? There's going to be a gathering. How much? Okay. When on the first day of the week? Who? Everyone? What? They're going to be laying aside. What are they going to be laying aside? Chickens? Ducks? Money. Probably not. Okay, by this time, we are into funds. All right, so I need some of this space back. Okay, can I, can I do this one first? All right, how much? How much were you expected to give? Where is that in there? We'll get to it in a minute. It's not all right here. How much? I had a friend years ago I was talking to about this particular topic, and uh, we, we don't all have the same quantity of goods and we don't all have the same obligation. One of the biblical principles is with greater opportunity comes greater responsibility. With greater gifts we have greater need to give and provide for others. As we have opportunity is one of the principles that's biblically there. The story of the uh, Good Samaritan that Jesus told. It's a story about opportunity. Now, if you came along there and you were poor, could you have taken care of uh, the man the same way the Good Samaritan did? No, but he was able. He was capable, and he did. It was an obligation. I had this friend, and uh, he told me about getting a bill from his church. I said, you got to be kidding. He said, nope, everybody does. The church leaders decide how much you owe in contribution. And you were expected to pay it during the year. You get a bill from the church. Does it go into collections if you don't? <laughs> no. Do they call you? No. I don't know what happens if uh, you know if it's the deadbeat group or you know if they start sending out nasty letters or what. But uh, I, there, I, I ran into another person who told me different religious organization that they were a part of, and uh, said, "Oh yeah." Yeah, we got a bill. Not only did we get a bill, but if you wanted anything special, you got a bill for that too. In fact, that was one of the reasons why she left the particular religious group that she did was because she got a bill for the funeral of her granddad. Wow. Kind of like an HOA thing. Actually, it was a bill in advance. The priest, the person who was involved said, 
uh, in order for them to do a serve a, a personal specific service for her granddad, it was going to take X dollars. Now, if he just wanted a, a group thing, then it'd be a lot less. But yeah, X dollars, like wow, really? Okay, so when Paul told the church. On the first day of the week, who gives, everyone gives. What are you doing? You're laying aside. You're storing up money. How much? That's up to you. How much? That's an individual choice. We're going to get more of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul specifically is going to come out and say, because now it's time to get it done. He said, this is not, a, not something to be done grudgingly. You give of your own free will. As God has given to you, as you have purposed in your own heart, as you have been prospered. All right, so it's going to be an individual thing. You decide how much. Wayne, you said you had something you wanted to. I was kind of sort of curious. I know that there's evidence that the, the church you know, members would take care of each other before yes. we see this. Yes. But is this the first time, like, uh, since the church was established, like 20 years later, that it was formalized, I guess, or. Uh, Standardized or set up to make it the first day of the week uh, for contributions. Before that, it was sort of a different, I don't know, it's yes, it's yes, can, I guess, but, but it wasn't actually a formalized process until probably back in the days of the Church of Galatia, which I guess was established, or, or they wrote the letter in 20, 50, 49 or 50. So was that about 20 years later that this was This is the first time we have it in print. Yeah. Now, it would be reasonable to assume that this was a regular thing that was being done because when does the church get together? Yeah. On the first day of the week. All right, now, you know, let's go back to Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 5, and get Ananias and Sapphira right. uh, getting killed, okay? Well, people were selling their property, bringing it to the apostles' feet. Was that only being done on Sunday? Did they only give the apostles money on Sunday? I don't know. Uh, if it was or not. It was, it's not described for us, that pattern back there. But now, Paul is establishing a principle. and says, here's what I'm telling you. Here's how to do it. You're going to do it like this. Here's why. Why? What is the... Give me one practical reason why this works. You've got a time, an application, who it does, what you're doing, uh, how much... Any of you ever borrowed money before? Did you pay it back in a lump sum? Or did you do the American way and make payments? You probably done both, depending on what it was. Uh, if it was a fairly small thing, you may have, you know, if you borrow 100 bucks from somebody, you may have paid them back 100 bucks. If you borrow 10,000 bucks from somebody, you probably didn't pay back the 10000 all in one check. The chances are you had payments of some sort that you paid weekly, monthly, or whatever. Um, and then there's a, you know, a reason for this. And most of it is, has to do with cash flow, a purpose, our, our way of living. If you had to come up with $50 a week, uh, you'd probably say, okay, I can come up with 50 bucks this week. In a month's time, that is 230 something Dollars, you figure 4.3 weeks a, a month. Uh, it's not 200, but anyway, you go from there. 52 weeks out of the year, you pay $50 a week. What does that end up being? $2,600. What's easier to pay? 50 bucks or 2,600? Make that 10 years. Now it's 26,000. $50 a week is not a big deal, but that adds up to in 10 years, $26,000. Coming up at 26,000 bucks, that may be a big deal. So Paul is getting ready for the church at some point. Now, when 2 Corinthians is written, Paul says to the Macedonians, or to the Corinth, I told the Macedonians a year ago, you guys were ready. So this is going to take a period of time before this unfolds. So Paul's giving them some time to get their contribution together, to get it ready to go for this administration, okay? So there's a very important principle as to us. What did what have we got? What can we give? And uh, by doing it in this way, then there's a very reasonable 
uh, way to take care of things. How do you eat a meal? One bite at a time. How do you walk a mile? One step at a time. How do we do any great thing? One small piece at a time. You don't take on the whole thing. And so Paul is trying to build this principle. Do it periodically in pieces as you're able, as you're prospered, so that you can get this done. This is a way to succeed. Bubba? A couple things I wanted to ask and kind of okay. throwing out a question here. Go ahead. Because I've talked with some, with some people. Um, it says first day of the week. So um, yep. if a person gave once a month, okay, let's say, you know, just the end of the month or the first of the month, whatever, um, what they were going to give the whole month. Um, you know, I know that's kind of borderline on split hairs, but it's, I, I is it okay? Is it? Um, no, absolutely. The church got to withdraw from them. You got to write four checks. Well, no, I mean every I, Sunday you got to put money in. Um, and, and another thing I'm getting at to here because um, it's kind of leading into the next question. But uh, I, I know personally my dad. I mean, he's passed away now, so I can say this. But he gave a, a once a year kind of deal mm -hmm. at times. But he would always put in. Every week, just a, a little bit of extra, you know, whatever. But so, if we maybe set an offering, set a, a prayer before, kind of a blessed what, but not pass, pass around a collection plate. Maybe like keep what we're doing now, put a box out. We're not passing around the collection know, plate. That's what I'm saying. But if, what, to do what we're doing now, to put yeah. a box out and not because some people say, well, it looks like you're begging, you know. Um, for, and I'm talking about for visitors. Yes. You know, for uh, making it a little more comfortable for them. And that's why I have suggested, I don't know if did it while Steve was ever uh, uh, doing it or not, but I have suggested to several of our announcement makers to address our visitors from the front and tell them, we're going to be participating in the Lord's Supper today. We do it every Sunday. You may or may not. We don't have what's called closed communion. If you're here and you want to participate, no one's going to stop you from participating. And we give our members an opportunity to make their contribution to the Lord. This is not for our visitors to feel obligated to give money. This is an opportunity for our members to be able to accomplish the worship that we see to God. So that's something, yeah, it would be appropriate to tell them. And now we have a more unique spot. And uh, I think it's very significant that we tell our visitors, hey, we're not going to be passing communion here. If you're going to take communion with us, you're going to have to get one of the cups in the back uh, because we're not going to be passing trays because of the, the thing we're doing. And the collection will be in the basket in the back. I had a conversation years and years ago with an elder when uh, we were using, studying through uh, one of the Gospels, and uh, Jesus was standing watching as they cast into the treasury. And some cast in great, and some he watched as a widow. What did the widow do? Widow. Cast in her two mites. Mites, the, the tiniest pennies we might, that'd be our best equivalent, throw in two pennies. <laughs> How much contribution would that be? Two pennies. Nearly nothing. I mean, literally. What can you do with a penny? What can you buy with a penny? Is there anything you could buy with a penny? I'm serious. Is there anything you could buy with a penny? I don't know of a single thing that only costs a penny. So if someone put in two pennies into the contribution, would you feel humiliated if all you had to give to, to contribute to God was two pennies? And Jesus praises this woman. And he says, this woman has put in greater than everyone else because she has nothing. And she gave two pennies. 
it's a principle of, of you know of, of what have you got? It's not on here yet. We haven't got that far, but. Um, and that, that's one thing I'm talking about with putting a basket out instead of having people pass it around because um, you know people pass it around because I've done it before. I mean, you, you see kind of what you don't see exactly how much they put in, but not, and, and people with humanistic. Instincts. Do we watch other folks? Do, yeah. or do you well, watch as the contribution plate is passed? Well, so much they put in, you know. Uh, it's yes. I'll give you the check, but it's already gone. I'll go get it out. <clears throat> when, when we were doing the, the trays. It is a conversation we've had before. If you know, if you, if you feel like now, did my does my wife been giving all these years? Yes. Yeah, we might run one check. Do we need to write two? Maybe so. <laughs> From now on, we may need to write two checks. You got Libby's check and Tim's check, but. It, it's ours. It comes out of the same place. But if you felt an obligation, I need to be giving. Are you giving? Well, that's something you have to ask for yourself. And it may be, I got started on a story and we got off of it. I was having this conversation. I was talking about the, Jesus watching the, uh, the treasury, the widow cash in her two mites. And I asked one of the guys in, the con in an, uh, uh, a Bible class, do we have to do it like we do it? Do we have to pass the trades around? Could we just have a box in the back of the auditorium where people came and put their contribution in? And one of the men, who was an elder, said, no, we need to do it like we do now. It needs to be done in the auditorium where we pass trades. I said, why? Why does it have to be done like that? Well, because you need to give everybody an opportunity. I said, everybody goes past the box. They get an opportunity. Well, you don't know if they're giving or not. And I said, uh, that's not something I need to keep up with. As an elder, whether or not you need to keep up with it or not is an interesting point of conversation. But I will argue that how this is done is irrelevant because it's not spelled out. If it's on the day, first day of the week, and you make the contribution. Now, uh, would it be inappropriate for a person who got paid once a month to make one contribution a year or once a contribution a month I do not believe that would be inappropriate at all but they didn't give every week this is a principle and I don't think it has to be broken up into 52 separate pieces in order for us to have met the spirit of the law now if that person was capable of giving one time a year and that's all they gave their complete contribution a year, once a year on the Sunday is that wrong some of you probably pay your car insurance once a month. You may have it set up as a bank draft. Often the insurance companies make that cheaper. Uh, several of my insurance policies, and I hate that I have several, but I do, I pay them once a year. Now, the, the bank or the, uh, the uh, insurance company get their money? They sure are. Are they happy with it? They sure are. Do they mind it's only once a year? They sure don't. Sit down, Shelby. We have to finish, too. I'm kidding. <laughs> Storing up as he may prosper. How much do you put in? How much individually as God has prospered you? So what do you... I hate to use the word owe. Oh. What do we have a responsibility to give? as God has given to us. Well, who decides that? You do. Individually, we decide for ourselves. And we, next week, Lord willing, we'll tie in some of this to 2 Corinthians, where Paul brings out, it's a spirit of the thing. This is not an obligation. It's a spirit of, I want to give to God. I want to help others and provide for the needs of the church, etc. Okay, that's all I've got time for.
three quarters of a verse ain't bad. <laughs>